My name is Karl Schreiber. I'm one of the organizers of the summer school, together with Jan Soika, who is in the back. Uh, you'll get to know everybody. And the third person in the, in the original organizing team is Fran Baganel, who is currently flying back from a meeting in Greece. She'll be here tomorrow morning. Um, and there's an, quite a number of te teachers, lecturers already here that you can all say hello to. What I'd like to say is this. This is supposed to be a, a rather informal meeting. If you have a question, ask a question. Um, if you think you have a naive question, there isn't one. Uh, the challenge of doing heliophysics is that it goes all the way basically from stellar evolution into the depth of the Earth and everything in between. So each of you is being specialized in one or more aspects of it, but nobody can oversee the whole thing. I think even the teachers here are learning lots of things because we're thinking, we are all thinking out of our boxes. I sit in all the lectures because I learn something new from everybody talking. So please feel free to ask a question. I don't mind, and I don't think most of us will mind, if you, if you have a very urgent question during a lecture, just raise your hand. The teacher can always decide to, to respond or not, and you have the nice meeting interface if it works. Uh, some cases it won't, because some of us will use keynote lectures, and then they don't work yet. Um, I think with that, we're going to go through the day with two lectures. Mark Moldwin will start one lecture, general introduction, and then Terry Forbes will do the afternoon lecture. In between, there's about an hour and a half in which we hope that we can get to know each other. Um, and Nick Gross, who is there in the back, uh, will be doing much of your lab sessions and leading much of the sessions that aren't the lectures. He will also be going through a round that will let you know each other a little better than we do currently. We have um, about 32 students here, half of which are from the US. Well, they're based in the US. They're not necessarily from the US. And half of them are from all over the world, going uh, to India and throughout Europe, from, from Sweden to Italy and from Ireland all the way into the Ukraine. Um, so there'll be times when we're supposed to talk fairly slowly and clearly. If you have trouble understanding someone, just make, a, make, make that known. Um, and there are students here that are starting their PhD work, and there are students here that have started their first postdoc position. So not only are we diverse in, in the backgrounds, we're also diverse in how far we are. So as I said, there are no naive questions. We all have lots of things to learn. I think that's all I wanted to say. Mark, you can take us into the introduction of heliophysics. Great. So is my mic working? Can, can you hear me in the back? OK. Well, I'm uh, Mark Moldwin. I'm a professor of space physics at the University of Michigan. And I was asked to kick off this meeting. And there's this summer school. Uh, there's a couple of uh, goals of the summer school. Uh, one is obviously to give an overview of this field of heliophysics from the sun to interstellar space, uh, from uh, the atmospheres and magnetospheres of the planets to the interplanetary medium. It's also to give you an opportunity to meet uh, colleagues uh, from around the world, ask questions, and they're trying this new NICE meeting. And one of the things you might notice on the bottom is there's a question button. Do you see that you can, if you start it up in my session? So I think, dude, Vlad, we might, can you see my presentation from yours? Do you see any buttons on the bottom? Do you see, qu what is it called, chat or question? or? ask a question. You're supposed to be able to do that. Vlad and I will look at it. <laughs> and we can you know, try to, hey, there's 15 people in the, that didn't understand that point type of thing. And so we'll see. And there's also, any of you familiar with clickers? Use clickers? So there, that, there's a pull button. And so there's opportunities to actually stop and see how you're, you're going. And so as the first lecturer, uh, what I wanted to do is get you used to using this so you'd be comfortable using it uh, throughout. The different lecturers uh, in the Heliophysics Summer School are going to be using NICE Meeting to, at one level or another. Not all of them are going to be doing it, but hopefully you'll become comfortable. The other thing is all of the presentations uh, will be available for you afterwards through this, right? So you have the opportunity. With NICE Meeting, you can write your own notes with the slides and you can. Uh, sort of annotate them uh, as you go. So 
what I wanted to do is sort of step back and get everybody on the same page. And we're going to see how this works. I'm just going to, I almost touched my screen here. It's going from iPad to desktop. Uh, let's see if I can get my poll to go. Did it do anything? So, and Vlad's in the back. Uh -huh. Okay, so I want to start it. See if this works. So hopefully you'll see a poll question come up. Start. I know. I know. I'm. <coughs> I have an iPhone and iPad and computer, but I'm a luddite in the classroom. I usually use my clickers are fingers. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Okay, what, what we'll do is, uh, let's see if I go back to presentation, if this helps. I'll just ask the question. <clears throat> so everybody pull out your clicker that you got at the bookstore, and the good news is you can sell them back at the end. But just one, two, three type of fingers. Uh, number one, I know all the domains of heliophysics. So if you had a background and, and know planetary atmospheres to magnetospheres to stellar astrophysics and radiative transfer to chemical photochemistry or whatever. One, agree. Two, kind of. Three, disagree. You ready? On three. And put it in, in front so you don't cheat. One, two, three. Go ahead. Tell me. What do you got? Okay, so we have ones, twos, and threes. So you guys are really are a pretty diverse uh, audience. How many of you, and you can raise your hand, have taken a graduate level space plasma physics course? So pretty much everybody, okay. How many of you are physicists in the traditional sense of getting a physics degree as an undergrad? Any engineers? Mathematicians? Chemists? Non-science undergrad degrees? <coughs> There's a few, occasionally. <laughs> okay. Uh, and all of you have read and marked up. So if I went to your library, I could pull it out, and it would be the very well-read, broken bindings, marked up version of the textbook. <laughs> so there are th uh, three textbooks that were written based on the summer school five to six years ago. And it's uh, essentially the big domains uh, covering everything. Uh, they're design they were written all by different authors, just like the lecturers here are, are different, but uh, Carl uh, was a very good editor and uh, made the textbooks uniform. So it's not like a lot of books that have multiple authors that are jumping around. Uh, there's references back and forth. And so uh, I'll be trying to refer to the textbook on some of the topics. So if you want to take a look at it, and I'll also try to refer to lectures that you'll see the rest of the week as we go through. So I'm going to give an overview and try to set the stage in terms of uh, understanding the physical processes. So I'm going to go back to the opening slide. and This heliophysics system, or heliophysics, this whole week we're going to be talking about two things, processes and domains. And when you think about heliophysics, a textbook, if you were going to write a textbook, how would you organize it? Or if you're going to write a review paper, how would you organize it? And you can go one way or the other. You can say domains. I'm going to start with the sun, and I'll tell you all about the sun, and then I'll go into the solar wind and interplanetary medium and tell you about that. And then I'll go to a magnetosphere. I might do comparative magnetospheres and talk about the Earth compared to Jupiter. And then I might go down and talk about ionospheres and neutral atmospheres, but I go domain to domain. And even within domains, I have subdomains. In the magnetosphere, you can talk about magnetopause. What are all the physics at the boundary? I could talk about the intermagnetosphere. I could talk about the radiation belts and ring currents inside the intermagnetosphere, right? So we often, when you ask somebody, what do you do? Oh, I'm a space physicist. So, well, what do you do? Well, magnetospheric physics. Well, what do you do? I study the radiation belts. Well, what do you do? You know, I build instruments, right? So you can go subfield down. And we do that logically. But often, when you do that, you sort of lose sight that we're all physicists. We're all using the same physics. So you could also say, you know, I, I'm a, a plasma physicist. 
and then you could, you know, a lab plasma physicist or a tokamak physicist or a low temperature plasma physicist, right? So you can start going out from there. But one of the interesting things is if you pull a textbook from any of those types of plasma physics, it's the same physics. We do the same thing. It's the same momentum equation, continuity equations. We have the same conservation of energy, and all the processes are the same. But the parameter space is different. So different terms in the equa equations become more and more important. So as a physicist, what you'd like to do is start big, know what the process is, and then figure out in my domain, I, these are the terms that are important. And so those terms are usually defined by scales, the temporal and spatial scale of the problem. So that's almost the first question I ask all PhD students during their exam is the scale of their problem. Because then you can then know what is important. Are you looking at plasma waves or are you looking at MHD? You know, what, what's the scale of the problem? And then I know, as soon as you tell me the scale, I can think of what terms are important and what I can neglect. Right? But if you don't know all these terms that I neglected, as you start looking at cross-scale coupling, you start using the same physics that doesn't work. And you can't figure out why. And it was that first assumption you made that I'm dealing in this scale so I can avoid that term is no longer valid anymore. So think big and go forward. So we're going to jump back and forth between processes and environments. And as I go through the environments, I'll go back to the same processes and see how they're different. The other thing we do as scientists, and when you say it like the way I do, it's kind of, it, it sounds almost terrible, but what almost all human endeavor, we try to understand structure and dynamics. So if you're an economist and you take a macro econ 101 textbook out, they'll talk about domains and processes, the banking system. What's the structure of the banking system? How do we do that? And then we can talk about money supply, how money supply changes, right? So we're doing the same thing in ionospheric physics. What's the structure of the ionosphere? How does the ionospheric density vary as a function of height? How would it be different on Mars than on Earth? Daytime, nighttime. What are the processes that give rise to that structure? And then how does it change, right? And so those are the types of questions. And so when you're thinking to organize your understanding of a field, start with those basics. What's the climatology or what is the normal structure. If I go there, most of the time, what will be the weather in Boulder in July? How could it be different if it's, if it's snowing out tomorrow? What's going on? What, what type of weather system must be happening to change that normal structure? So that's when you get, start getting into the processes. What is causing uh, those dynamics? And so things that you've been taught pretty much throughout your life, and it's hard to believe that you've been uh, learning all your life, and hopefully you never stop learning, but one of the, the tools are comparing and contrasting, developing analogies. So if you're a solar physicist, anything I've learned about the solar atmosphere, can I apply it to an extrasolar heliosphere? Or can I apply it, is there any similarities with the atmosphere of a planet? Or, or whatnot? Can I figure out one thing? I study the Earth. Can I apply that to Jupiter? Could I apply that to another planet? And so what you should hopefully do as you go through this week, each lecture, try to write down a one or two sentence summary. What was the key point? What's the concept? What were the process? What was the domain? So talked about the solar atmosphere and the importance of radiation or whatever. Right? So just try to summarize it. And then as you go through, you can start seeing those connections. Oh, we talked about the same process. In Jupiter and on the Sun, where we talked about the same type of structure, it had the same type of vertical structure, so maybe the physics are the same. Right? So try to do that, keep, keep notes. And we can try using that ask a question, or you, you can raise your hand, maybe that would be uh, just as good. Okay, let's see if move forward. So, I told you to summarize the lecture, and so here it is. If you want to just take a note, screenshot. I'm going to try to reduce the entire universe to three structures. So 
when you talk about structures and processes, there's really only three structures. And the two that I'm going to talk about mostly uh, this morning and then a, the other one after the break are flux tubes and current sheets. And you can sort of think of these as the fundamental unit of uh, magnetized plasmas. So wherever you have a magnetized plasma, you have flux tubes and current sheets. And they're everywhere. So not only if you're a space physicist, but if you're an astrophysicist, you have to think about the structure of uh, the domain you're looking at in, in terms of flux tubes and current sheets. And what's interesting is they have huge scales. So astrophysicists doing uh, stellar astrophysics or galactic dynamics also can uh, think about uh, the structure that they see in a relativistic jet or in a uh, planetary nebula in these terms. Often, though, any of you in astrophysics, astronomy background? So one of the interesting things, of, to, it's changed a lot, but astronomy, uh, simplify, simplify, simplify. So everything's a sphere, everything's in local thermodynamic equilibrium, and you don't have any magnetic fields, right? So. Now throw into the magnetic fields and allow a little structure. <laughs> I said it's changing. <laughs> so that's space physics is uh, we get to observe things in situ. You're going to hear later uh, today uh, about reconnection. And one of the punchlines is reconnection uh, is the process that you need to understand if you're going to understand the dynamics of magnetized plasmas. So understanding the physics of reconnection is very important. And reconnection is the process that makes the connections between flux tubes or different domains. How do you transfer energy, mass, and momentum from one domain to another? Magnetic reconnection is one of the key ways of doing that. And so think about, as we go through the week, what are the similarities and differences from all the domains? So why do you have to study specifically solar physics? What is different on the sun than on the Earth? You can say, well, the temperatures are extremely different. Well, what does the temperatures do? What physics does it bring in that you don't have to worry about when you're studying the ionosphere of Mars, per se? So I was talking about radiation. So we don't have as much x-rays and ultraviolet, right? And so then if you have that energy source, what do you have to think about in terms of transport and chemistry, right? So think about processes. Let's see. And I'm doing this through the NICE meeting. so. If you send me a question, I still see zero. I should be able to see it. OK, so uh, for the rest of the 20 minutes or so, I'm going to posit that we're, there's three universal magnetic structures. And they're flux tubes, current sheets, and the third one are cavities. And if there are only three structures, does that tell you anything about the processes that set those up? What physics ordains that there are only three things in the plasma universe that you have to worry about? Why only three? Why not six? Why not ten? What's going on? So I think this next slide should get you involved a little bit. Uh, what I want you to do you're in tables of five-ish or so, uh, split up in twos and threes, introduce yourself to your neighbor, and then see if you can come up with examples of each of these three. So I'm only going to give you about two minutes, so a quick introduction. And I assume you're going to be broken up into different groups. I saw that there are some places well represented, others not. Make sure you're sitting next to somebody you don't know, at least for the most of the meeting. And then hopefully by the end of the meeting, it will be hard to find a place to sit next to somebody you don't know. But go ahead. We have two minutes.
so? Yes. Okay, about 30 seconds, so make sure you get at least one example of each. Okay, everybody, if we can uh, come back and if, if this was a semester long class, whenever I come to the front is when you should come back <laughs> to discussion. Okay, so I actually have a list of names and I think there's a, there's a Patrick here, right? A Patrick, somebody named Patrick? Patrice. Patrice from Montreal? No, okay, there is a Patrick. From Montreal. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. You want to give an exa one example of any of those? Sure. So when we often, if I gave you a dipole magnet and I asked you to draw the magnetic field lines, hopefully you would be able to draw those magnetic field lines. And I said, if I then said, what if there's plasma on those magnetic field lines? Is there a way I can define the plasma from maybe one field line to another? And then you start thinking of magnetic flux being a cross-sectional area. So then you start thinking of a tube, and then you got your flux tube, right? So plasma organizes itself because there are magnetic forces that keep charged particles along a magnetic flux tube or along a magnetic field line, right? So the Lorentz force and the mirror forces and the gradients and uh, pressure along and parallel to the magnetic field can keep plasma on these flux tubes. Okay, how about a volunteer? And what I actually want you to do is volunteer your new friend. Anybody want to volunteer their new friend to give an example of a current sheet? You can actually answer the question as well, but... So all of you guys are watching the Whitey Bulger trial in Boston. The number one rule of the mob is never rat fink out a friend. So you know. Well, I just took the typical under, undergraduate uh, you know, current sheet, something that's, that's thin but wide, like the uh, notebook or something like this. OK. Does it, can anybody tell me why you have a current sheet? What's the physics of current sheets? So magnetic reconnection can happen across current sheets. But why current sheets? You could, could have current sheets that don't have reconnection, right? I mean, okay. so yeah. okay. So Ampere's law tells you that a curl of B is mu not J. So wherever I have a curl of the magnetic field or the field that are not in the same direction, even slightly, I'm going to have to have a current between those flux tubes. So now I if I envision the plasma universe filled with flux tubes, I can imagine that many of them are aligned. So I can say there's no current between those flux tubes. But if there's a way that I can shear those flux tubes or somehow twist them around, I can imagine I can get shear. And once I have shear, I have to have a current or a current sheet between those flux tubes. And in many places, I could have 
big shear, 180 degree shear between field coming from one direction and another direction. So I get these big current sheets. And so the heliospheric current sheet is often drawn as this wavy ballerina skirt, but a thin current. So if I was a satellite flying through it, how would I observe that current sheet? I would see the shear of the magnetic field, right? I'd see it turning from one direction to another. Yes. So this, this is something that lasts a million times, but no one's ever made an answer. Can you directly measure the current sheets? You mentioned you measure a shear in the magnetic field, but can you measure the current sheet itself or its presence? So I'm a magnetometer guy. So you measure currents with magnetic field. <laughs> but if you expand out, what is J? What's current density? How can you rewrite that in terms of a, a plasma moment? What is J? That's the curl of B, but in terms of plasma moment, so. Okay, so it's the den density of charge carriers, and you're looking at the difference between ions and electron flow velocity, right? So you often will see an NQ V I minus V, right? And so if I had a plasma instrument that could measure distributions of ions and electrons, and I could actually measure that difference, I could then say I measured that current. But what's the difference between I and J? Okay, one's a density. So how would I know what the volume or aerial current is from a single point measurement of a satellite crossing. And if you're a lab person, you just put probes everywhere, right? And so, you, <laughs> so what you'd like to do is sample everywhere, and then you can do it. So that's the other way. If you think of it in terms of the motion of charged particles, you can make those measurements. It's difficult because it's a, a volume, and in, particularly in space, the volumes are huge. Mm -hmm. So you have to make all types of assumptions. You know, or, you know there's been... Uh, uh, published papers, uh, and as a lesson, as a early postdoc, I wrote my first comment on a paper that attempted to show you could have currents. And eight referees, and three years later, <laughs> I realized I'm never writing a comment again. <laughs> but uh, Lou Frank had published papers with geotel data. Uh, but if you look at the data, it's all statistical noise. It's really hard to make that measurement, particularly with the Lou Frank instrument. At the bar, you can. There's some really good Lou Frank stories. Okay. So, anybody know what a cavity is? And part of the difficulty is perhaps the term cavity. It might not be clear. Um, I think my first thing in mind was um, the actual layer itself. So, some quality of the layer is um, space that's got that's self contained. Great. So, right. Can I have one that would not be confined? Uh, well, there, it's a more strike a nesting doll. You can have all different types of scales of cavities, and I guess you could even go all the way down to a flux tube. <laughs> yep. Any volume of the surface of the ground on the inside is almost Okay. I mean, it's a, essentially any contained uh, magnetized plasma that inside it, whatever the source of that magnetic field and plasma is defines it, or the origin of it defines it, and outside is something else. So you guys gave a couple of examples. Um, let's see if I wrote it up. Uh, so a magnetosphere or the entire heliosphere itself, and then uh, figure 2.7 has a lot of pictures of different cavities. We talked about the heliospheric current sheet, and essentially magnetospheric current sheets uh, will be talked about uh, quite a bit. You can imagine those current sheets down in the lower atmosphere of the sun and in the corona separating uh, flux tubes from the sun where you can get the reconnection for, for flaring and coronal mass ejection uh, processes. And then these flux tubes are essentially the everything we see and in, Chapter 6 tucks and defines flux tubes in volume 1. Okay, 
So here's a picture of a 2D picture cartoon of the sun, and you can see uh, one of the things we talk about for uh, heliophysics is the topology of a field line. So is the field line connected back to the sun or back to the earth or back to Jupiter? And we uh, divide the topology into two open field lines that have one foot at the planet or the star and the other one out closing somewhere else. And then we have closed field lines that have both ends connected to the surface. And so the next question is, how do I go from a closed to an open? Or is there a static amount of open flux everywhere and a static amount of closed flux? And no. But you can talk about uh, a coronal mass ejection or a flux rope as uh, part of these uh, cavities and uh, flux tubes. And you can imagine that there is plasma on all of these field lines uh, defining those flux tubes. So this is the 2D example of a cavity of current sheets and flux tubes. OK. So just going to go pretty quick. But if you remember your momentum equation, your Newton's second law F equals ma, the force terms on the right-hand side is this pressure gradient and this J cross B term. And when you look at what that J cross B term is, what is the force uh, due to these uh, magnetic fields and currents? Uh, you can derive this uh, frozen influx. And there's uh, one of the basics, bases of uh, plasma physics is uh, MHD and understanding the dynamics of these flux tubes and, and if they can interact or not, and if they can, how. And just a specific equation in, in volume one, if you want to take a look. But if I expand out that J cross B, because I could rewrite J as curl B, right? So I could take Ampere's law, so I have curl B cross B, and I can do that triple product. Look at the back of my Jackson book on what the right triple product is. And you get two terms. One has this B squared uh, over 2 mu naught sort of pressure gradient, this uh, uh, term. And that, that is a force term uh, perpendicular to the field. And the other one is this tension force, which is a force along the field. And so you can think of flux tubes as rubber bands, that as you pull them or twist them, you put tension on them. And there's going to be a force that wants to restore it back to a low energy state. But they're mutually repulsive. I can't cross these rubber bands. So if I get a whole bunch of flux tubes sheared around, they're going to get all twisted up. Right? And they're going to have uh, currents forming along the side of them. So these are these elementary particles of uh, space physics. If I add a current along the magnetic field, what happens to that flux tube is I now have a magnetic field component that wraps around the main field, right? So if I have a field aligned current along a magnetic field, my thumb in the direction of the magnetic field, the Osevar says I have a magnetic field that wraps around it. So if I sum those fields, I now get this helical structure. And we call those flux ropes. So I'm, most flux tubes have some type of twisting to it. So often you see flux tubes or flux ropes uh, talked about. You'll hear later uh, about magnetic reconnection, but the cool thing about magnetic reconnection, it does a couple of things. It is a way to convert the magnetic energy into uh, particle kinetic energy, but it's also a way to change the topology to break flux tubes or reconnect flux tubes. So I can get a exchange of mass from one flux tube through another to another, where I can have solar wind plasma entering in a closed magnetosphere through a reconnection process. So you'll hear reconnection pretty much in every lecture for the rest of this week. It is a fundamental process. So just a, a cartoon to visualize this flux tube with the current running along, it causes it to twist. And if you fly a spacecraft through it or have this fly over a spacecraft, you 
often get this characteristic bipolar turning. You see the direction of the field one way, and when you go through it, you see it going the other way. And we have examples of these all over the place. Coronal mass ejections often have uh, evidence of uh, twists, and so it's often the cartoons are dr drawn as they're these big flux tubes or twisted flux ropes that expand out. And a lot of the coronal mass ejection models either start with a flux tube that formed deep down in the photosphere that erupts out or, or through reconnection processes in the atmosphere gets twisted up through, the, through shears and uh, are ejected out. Okay, so when you think about uh, flux tubes, flux ropes, if I had all these individual domains, the heliosphere, the magnetospheres, how do they actually interact? How does energy, mass, and momentum actually go from the sun into the Earth's space environment, or into the Mars atmosphere, or into the Jovian magnetosphere? Right? How does it happen? And <coughs> we mentioned the, the main, this main interaction is through reconnection. And since you're going to hear a lot about this uh, in a few moments, to show a cartoon from MMS. The next NASA road uh, map mission is called Magnetospheric Multiscale. And it's a four spacecraft mission that's supposed to fly in a tetrahedron. And if I'm going to try to measure the curl, if you actually expand out your IJK matrix for a curl, you see how many different terms do I need to observe to actually solve that? I need to know what the gradient of the field is in one direction. So you need these four in a tetrahedron. And if I can measure what the magnetic field differences are between those pairs of spacecraft, I can actually solve the curl. And so I can measure these currents. And where do I have currents that are very intense? And the magnetosphere are across current sheets. And there are current sheets in the magnetopause, because I have the solar wind with the embedded interplanetary magnetic field. And that magnetic field, though it has a normal Parker spiral, it can be in any direction. And the Earth's field always points north. So in general, the boundary between the magnetosphere and the solar wind is a widely varying magnetic field. And so Ampere says I have to have a current flowing along the magnetopause, the Chapman current, that separates the magnetic field flux tubes of the IMF from the flux tubes of the Earth. And if the conditions are right, I can get reconnection. And that's where I can then have these rubber bands break. I can release explosively a lot of this magnetic energy, this magnetic tension. And then I can cause plasma jets and plasma heating and, and all types of uh, dynamics that we look for. But when you think of a current sheet, you're thinking of magnetic field going in opposite directions. And one of the standard analytical models that you've probably all seen is the Harris neutral sheet model, which has this hyperbolic tangent function that uh, has the magnetic field going in one direction and the other. And then you can imagine if there's a, a way for dynamics that I can bring these flux tubes of op opposite polarity together, some magic can occur, some magnetic reconnection. Uh, what are the physics? And after break, we'll start talking a little bit about scales again. And what are the scales of magnetic reconnection? And I'm going to skip this, uh, but if you go online, there's uh, a lot of effort has been going on in trying to understand the formation of coronal mass ejections. Why are they flux ropes? What does the role of flux rope have in reconnection? As I mentioned, there's two classes of models. I can start with the flux rope, or I could have it created. Uh, how does this closed flux actually escape from the sun? I'm going to have to have reconnection uh, between this uh, CME with the overlying field. I can have reconnection back down at the feet, uh, these flaring sites. And uh, a lot of models and observations are suggestive that uh, reconnection is very important for the formation of uh, coronal mass ejections. There's also evidence that there's magnetic reconnection 
going on across the heliosphere current sheet. So I can set up current sheets easily in the sun just by moving flux tubes around with different foot point motions I can get that shear. The current sheet, because I have the polarity of the sun, it changes throughout the solar cycle, but you can imagine that there are field lines that are leaving one pole of the sun and the other pole of the sun, and there's a, to a towards and a way sector. If you look at the IMF in the interplanetary medium, you see that the magnetic field is ordered generally. It's at Earth in a Parker spiral, but you can be above or below the current sheet, and you'll see field lines going back toward the sun or away from the sun. And so this current sheet forms and Jack Gosling and Ty Fan have presented a lot of observations of high temporal uh, wind data, uh, NASA mission wind, to see uh, signatures of uh, uh, exhaust jets and uh, uh, petric type of uh, structures. We also have reconnection between this solar wind and the IMF with the Earth and this uh, famous picture of uh, Dungy sort of uh, changed the paradigm of uh, magnetospheric dynamics. Why does, why are there aurora? Why is there a ring current? And you can try to figure, how do I get energy from the sun into the earth? And until we figured out that there's a way to couple the solar wind energy into the magnetosphere, it was hand waving. And so now we know that most of the energy, almost all of the dynamics that we see Magnetosphere and ionosphere are solar wind driven. So if I want to know what's going to happen, I have to look in the sun. You'll hear a few uh, lectures this week talking about energy from below. What if I can dump energy through gravity waves upward? How can that change the dynamics of the middle atmosphere, the thermosphere, and the ionosphere? And you'll see that there's both energy going from above and below if you really want to understand it. And of course, the ionosphere, which is not even drawn on this plays a role in the dynamics because of the conductivity of the feet of the field lines of the Earth. But you can get reconnection on the day side that causes these flux tubes to open. So I start with a closed magnetic field line. I have a southward interplanetary magnetic field line. I bring them together. And just in a sim simple vector, naively, in your first year of physics, if I had a vector of field of 10 nanotesla southward, and I added it to a vector field of 10 nanotesla northward, what would you get? Simple vector addition. Zero, right? They cancel out. But magnetic field has energy in it. So where did the energy go? So that's the reconnection, is that you're converting some of that magnetic energy into uh, plasma kinetic energy. But the other thing I, I do besides this field annihilation or rapid diffusion, or however you think of your right-hand <coughs> side of the equation, I also change the topology of the field line. I go from one uh, field line that's closed on the Earth, both feet on the Earth, and one that's in the solar wind, and I make two new field lines, both of them open, one that's going into the north, one is coming out of the south. So I've connected a earth flux tube with a solar wind flux tube. So I've taken two flux tubes and I made two new flux tubes that are now open. And they get pulled back over the polar cap so I get this uh, convection pattern. And so if you're uh, the ionospheric lectures, you'll see that there's this convective often two cell pattern in the high latitude polar regions. And it's these feet of the field line being pulled from the day side to the night side. They form the magneto tail of the Earth. And then I have this current sheet here, because I have field going towards the Earth in the north and away from the Earth in the south. I can get reconnection. If I have multiple reconnection across a current sheet, I can get these islands or plasmoids. But I often have a field out of the board, too, so I get it twisted up, so I get a flux rope. So I, often I'm interchanging from simple flux tubes to more complex flux tubes from one cavity to another cavity. And in the process, I'm converting magnetic energy to kinetic energy. So here's just a 3D uh, simulation of magnetic reconnection in the Earth's magneto tail. And you can see this plasmoid formed. And the white lines are the magnetic field lines. And you can see it's twisted up if I have a, a Y component or a component into the board. 
and it's very similar to the processes in the coronal mass ejection and magnetic cloud uh, models uh, from the sun. Uh, one of my favorite images, uh, a colleague at UCLA uh, studying the center of the Milky Way, and they're looking at the supermassive black hole and want to figure out the orbital dynamics of the stars that are going around it to estimate the mass, and whenever they fall in, the stars scream, ah, and release all their x-rays and stuff, <laughs> and we, we, we learn uh, more about those processes. But just taking uh, infrared photos towards the center, uh, they saw this nebula that looks like uh, a picture from a chronograph image of Earth. <laughs> if you zoomed up in on a CME, you often see these uh, flux tubes uh, twisted up. Uh, but this is uh, 80 light years. So these helical flux tubes are everywhere from the sun to the magnetosphere. They're seen in the Venus ionosphere. There's just a paper in Science or Nature uh, this year showing evidence of magnetic reconnection of flux tubes in the Mars ionosphere. There's a remnant crustal magnetic field that can interact with the solar wind as it goes by and have reconnection and form these things as well as in astrophysical plasmas. There's a lot of uh, relativistic uh, jets and streams that have huge shears uh, creating uh, 3D relativistic <laughs> MHD <laughs> type uh, uh, jets. So this morning I just wanted to introduce you to the three things, cavities, current sheets, and flux tubes. They're everywhere. So for every lecture you see for the rest of this week, they're going to be focusing on the cavity itself, or the boundaries of those cavities, the current sheets, or the structure internally, what makes the plasma sphere different than the plasma sheet or the lobe or, or whatnot, and the flux tubes, and what's in those flux tubes, and if they're open or closed, determine what they are. And we're going to have a short break now, come back, I'll give uh, some more examples of uh, these processes, and then later today we're going to have reconnection, understanding the dynamics across these current sheets, and this interchange. And I do not know what the break means. Is it 10 minutes? Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to start at 9.35. Drink water.